Hello everyone, welcome to the afternoon session on population ecology. There's some really great talks coming up. Um, I see that one, one talk has withdrawn. We will have to stick to the programme strictly, even so. Um, and uh, we'll wait until exactly a quarter past and then I'll introduce. So first up, it's my pleasure to announce that we have uh, Stephen Cornell, all the way from Liverpool University, and uh, he's going to be talking about optimal connectivity measures. Thanks, um, So uh, this is joint work with um, Yifian's Shupinenku, who's based also in Liverpool, and with Otto Oberskainen, who's in Helsinki some of the time, and Shrunk time for some of the time. Um, it's unpublished work, so uh, I'd be grateful if you uh, didn't share it on social media. So connectivity is one of the most important concepts in landscape ecology. Uh, so for a while it's been recognised that organisms benefit more from resources that are close to each other than if they are sparse. So um, originally this was the kind of picture that people had, that this, these were patches of resources that one organism might need, and so one animal might move between these and benefit from all these different resources together. And it's important that these are close by so that the, the same animal can, can benefit from them. But with the advent of uh, metapopulation ideas, it's become um, understood that actually these could be much larger patches, uh, so large enough that in fact um, any one animal might not, not never actually leave it during their, their lifetime. But there's still a benefit from these patches being close to each other, because if one of these patches uh, goes extinct, it can be rescued by a neighbouring patch, and that neighbouring patch may have actually been colonised by the original patch itself. So there's a, a positive feedback, which means that even at a quite large scale, it's still important for habitat to be close. Uh, so this is very important for conservation policy, with a recognition that habitat uh, needs... Uh, must not only be uh, conserved, so that there must not only be enough habitat, but also it's important that it's, uh, it's joined up. So ecologists have developed a number of measures to quantify this connectivity, to quantify the importance of uh, individual patches within a landscape. And I'm going to talk about these kinds of measures which were inspired from uh, metapopulation ideas. And what these do is they, uh, so for each patch I, you look at the quality of other patches J nearby, and then the, um, the connectivity is a kind of a weighted sum of these qualities of all the other patches. And it can either be that you sum just all the patches within a certain distance, so less than R, or you can weight them by this exponential, which is meant to represent a dispersal kernel. So this kind of formula comes from the, um, from, as I said, from metapopulation modelling. And it looks rather like the, the colonisation rate for a metapopulation model. So the idea then is to say, well, this kernel here should be the same thing as the dispersal kernel. But um, although these, uh, these are used in various tools for reserve design, for designing which habitat to conserve, in fact, we don't really have any underlying theory that explains why this would be a good way of, uh, of measuring um, the value of individual patches, or indeed whether this is the best uh, way of measuring uh, the value of individual patches. Uh, so Asa Molinen um, and co-worker um, back uh, 20 years ago or so did do an empirical study, but there really hasn't been any theory to discuss whether these are good measures of the value of patches. 
So this is a theoretical study, and the aims of it really are, first of all, just to say how well do these kinds of landscape connectivity measures of the sort I've shown on the previous slide, how well do they actually pre predict occupancy of patches in a metropolitan? Um, what specifically, if, if we're to choose between different measures, which measure is the best one for predicting occupancy? Uh, and if we get the, the measure wrong, if we choose a suboptimal measure, how much does it actually matter? And finally, is there some kind of simple rule, uh, series of rules of thumb that we can, um, we can develop from these, uh, from these ideas for improving the measures which we're using? So the underlying model is a uh, stochastic patch occupancy metapopulation model. So the idea is that we have a certain number of patches uh, in continuous space, and they can be either occupied in these filled symbols or they can be empty. Um, and the dynamics are that an empty patch can be colonized, and all of the other occupied patches uh, in the vicinity can, uh, can colonize it by, by propagules. And so the total rate of colonization is a, a sum of contributions from the other patches weighted by the dispersal kernel C uh, for the distance between the, the patch that's doing the colonizing and our focal patch. The uh, patches can also go extinct, so if they're occupied, like this one here, or that one there, there can be some kind of a, a, a event which causes the, just a, a fluctuation, chance fluctuation, which causes the population to go extinct. And also we have a dynamic landscape, so these patches can be created and destroyed. So patches are, first of all, created with some kind of rate R, and they can just appear at random. And when they appear, they are, um, they are uh, empty patches, so they, they appear as uncolonized patches. Or alternatively, they can be de destroyed, so some kind of storm or something can come along and remove patches, and that can, be, can happen whether the patch is occupied or indeed whether it's, uh, it's um, empty. So that's the, the dynamics. It's quite simple, um, uh, quite simple model. Um, now, it's so simple that actually it ignores patch quality. So that's the first disappointment to anyone who's come here to, to really to, to find some advice on connectivity measures. This model doesn't make, include patch quality. Um, and also, it doesn't have landscape correlations. Now, actually, this is a model that I studied with, uh, with my co-author, um, Otto Overskynen, some years ago. And we did their study, a, a correlated landscape. It's just that in this case here, um, for simplicity, we, we were just curious to see what happens if we have a, an uncorrelated landscape that is nevertheless dynamic. And what we were interested in in the previous study was how does the occupancy of this metapopulation depend upon the, the properties of the landscape? So specifically, the, the landscape dynamics. Um, how does that affect the, uh, the probability that, that a patch is, is going to be occupied? And we used a technique um, which gave us some analytical results. So these are analytical results which give a, a good approximation, provided that the colonization range is large-ish compared to the distance between patches. So the order of um, two or three times is usually sufficient. Um, I won't say anything more about this, but if you uh, want to know more, then ask Ace, who did his PhD using them. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is to talk about a general class of connectivity measures. I say general, it's not completely general, but really what I'm going to say is I'm going to call connectivity some kind of weighted sum of the um, other patches weighted by something I'll just call H. So this is, I'll call this a connectivity kernel. So this needn't be a dispersal kernel, it could be something else. And I explore uh, what the effect of different choices is. You'll see that this is different from the, the, the measures I had on the, the, the previous but one slide in that there's no patch quality here, that's because patch quality isn't present in the, the model. So effectively I'm saying that the mo all patches have the same quality. Here I'm looking specifically at the effects of the spatial arrangement of the patches. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate how good it is as a predictor of occupancy using just a product moment correlation uh, coefficient. So this is just the standard um, Pearson uh, product moments correlation coefficient between this connectivity measure S and <coughs> occupancy sigma, which is just something which is zero if there's a patch that's unoccupied at X or one if there's a patch that's occupied. And this, this is just averaged over all the patches in the metal population. And this then quantifies how well this connectivity measure that I've um, written down here predicts the occupancy. And I'm going to ask, well, first of all, how does R depend upon the metal population parameters? So if I just have a fixed choice of kernel, um, if I change the, the properties of the metal population, how does that um, affect this, this correlation coefficient? And I'm also going to uh, say, how does it depend upon this choice of kernel? And that's really what I'm interested in, is whether um, different kernels give a better um, or a worse correlation between um, occupancy and connectivity. So this is just a, a graph which illustrates the, the effects of different metapopulation parameters on, the, uh, on this, this correlation. So here's the correlation coefficient between occupancy and connectivity. These three lines are for different... Uh, average uh, patch occupancy. So in green, I've got a relatively high occupancy, so two-thirds of the patches are occupied. And in black, I have a relatively low occupancy, so only one in six is, is occupied. 
And this here is the, this summarizes the, uh, the patch turnover dynamics within the, um, the, the, the metal population. So over here, um, the patches turn over very slowly and the landscape is effectively static. And over here on the right, the patches turn over very quickly. And in fact, almost all of the extinctions of patches are caused by patches being removed rather than by just spontaneous extinction where the patch itself do doesn't vanish. So the first thing that you'll see is that the correlation gets weaker as the landscape gets more dynamic. So I've kept the metal population parameters um, in a certain relationship to make sure that as I move down this, this curve, the occupancy stays constant. Because if, if I just made the, the, the patch turnover um, more rapid whilst keeping everything the same, actually the, the, the occupancy would go down. So I've had to um, um, tweak the other parameters as this happens. But what you can see is that the, the correlation always gets weaker for more dynamic metal populations. And this was observed by Jenny Hodgson some years ago uh, in empirical and also simulation data. And so what this essentially means is that as the uh, the metal population becomes more has, has a more dynamic landscape. It just means that there's more noise in the uh, the the, um, uh, the process which colonizes and causes uh, extinctions. What you'll also see is that for the static landscape on the left here, you can see that the correlation gets stronger when the occupancy gets lower. So if we have a, a relatively low occupancy in the metal population, there's a much stronger correlation between connectivity and occupancy. So that's even though that there are more patches which are occupied here, they're eff effectively more random than they are. Uh, I mean, with, with, with regard to the, the connectivity, that when the occupancy is very low. Whereas, by contrast, for dynamic landscapes over here, what you find is that the correlation actually gets stronger as the occupancy gets higher. So we see this opposite behaviour for um, the, uh, the static and the uh, dynamic landscapes. What am I doing for time? Thank you. Okay, so that's how the, um, this, this correlation depends upon the, the metapopulation parameters. What about in terms of the kernel choice? So they, here I want to say what's the best choice of kernel to give the best um, correlation. So uh, it's possible actually just to, to, to do a uh, calculation which tells you for a given metapopulation set of parameters, including the, the, the dispersal kernel, what is the optimal shape of this kernel age. And it turns out to be related strongly to the spatial autocorrelations in patch occupancy. But in particular, what you find is that the optimal kernel is not the dispersal kernel C. So most connectivity measures assume that actually you should use a dispersal kernel, but actually that's not the case. And in fact, it's not even in the same family. So if you have an ex exponential dispersal kernel, actually what you get is a more complicated uh, analytical form. And the only exception is when it's one of these modified Bessel functions of the second kind and zeroth order, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Because these are actually what emerge when, when, when dispersal is caused by a um, random walk with mortality. So this is a paper that I wrote with uh, Otso some years ago on that, uh, that topic. So these things, that might look unfamiliar, but actually it's, it crops up in, a quite, uh, in, in many situations. So this is just to show um, if we have a dispersal kernel, which is one of these Bessel functions, and we choose the connectivity kernel to be the optimal one, which is also a, a Bessel function with a particular lambda. And for the op optimal value of, of, of this uh, length scale that, that characterizes the connectivity kernel, what you find is that it's always larger than the, um, the length scale for dispersal. If, if the landscape is static, then it's actually much larger, especially when the occupancy is very small. Whereas if the landscape is very dynamic, then actually it's a little bit larger uh, and in fact, as you can see, never more than about 1.5 times larger than the, uh, the length scale for dispersal. Okay, so if um, the occupancy is high or if the patch turnover is very slow, um, so sorry, if, if the uh, occupancy is very high or the turnover is, is, is very fast, then actually the, the length scale is very similar, otherwise it could be very different indeed. This here is just a graph that illustrates how much it matters or not, whether you get the right um, length scale for your, your connectivity kernel. So here I've just chosen not necessarily the optimal value of lambda, but just another value of lambda. So here, if I choose the optimal value of lambda here, then lambda equals lambda opt, and I get the maximal correlation. If I choose my lambda to be different by a factor of 10 on either side, this is a logarithmic scale, then the correlation <coughs> reduces by about, two, by about a factor of 0.4, less you. Okay, so we can talk about other kernels, and really the, the story is effectively um, the same. So the, the, the point is that you, to get the, the best kernel, you need to know an awful lot of, about your species. So in practice, what you normally do is you just assume an exponential kernel, and then you, but you, can, you can still talk about what's the best uh, length scale for that kernel. Here's what you do for a particular choice. And this is, again, just showing that you get essentially the same picture, that the um, static landscapes, when the occupancy is low, have the highest um, correlation, and those which are dynamic, um, have the lowest correlation when the occupancy is, 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 is low. And this is then the, um, what you would get if you use the same uh, length scale for dispersal as for your connectivity kernel. And this is the best choice here, which can be usually at a somewhat larger length scale. And the gain you get from having a, uh, the optimal choice of uh, connectivity 
kernel length is about a, fa a factor of two in this correlation. Okay, so as I said, the, the first big uh, disappointment you will have found would have been that the model doesn't include patch occupancy, so that really is something which ought to be included within this, uh, um, this scheme. You might also wonder whether this is actually the best way to evaluate the performance of your connectivity measure. So really maybe you want to have some kind of quantity that says to what extent does this choice impact on the, uh, the whole metric population. Uh, but unfortunately, um, if you want to use other kinds of connectivity measures, which are things such as uh, measuring the least path, then actually these methods that I've described are really not up to the job. So in conclusions, uh, the conclusions are that it's possible to in in improve the uh, predictability of occupancy from connectivity by choosing different kernels. Uh, ideally, you do this by measuring the spatial autocorrelations in your metapopulation, which might be quite difficult. Um, but as a rule of thumb, if you've got very high patch turnover, you may as well just use a dispersal kernel. And if patch turnover is low, then we have a formula for predicting how much larger you should have, should have your length scale. And probably things will change when we include patch uh, quality. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Anyone got a question for Stephen? Maybe I'll ask Stephen. Uh, so uh, you, you considered the different uh, patch occupancies it's by varying the yeah. the, uh, the colonization rate. Is that right? <laughs> Is it the same same pattern if you vary the, the extinction rate or? It's the same. There's, 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 there's a scaling. There's, there's the ratio of the, the, the three different things. So if you measure it, if you measure it in terms of the sum of the uh, extinction and uh, patch removal rate, then it yeah. And, uh, no one else has a question. I'll have one more question. <laughs> Just got time. Um, do you think that the, the this analysis would be extendable to a case where the patches are have different levels of occupancy? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's quite, quite similar. So yes, I mean certainly. So the um, it's obviously simpler if, if they are just ones and zeros, but it's, it's quite difficult, quite easy to, to write down a very similar model where you have different levels of, of occupancy. The, the algebra gets a bit more heavy, but you can certainly do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's thank Steve once again. And, uh, so the next talker is Hedvig uh, Nenzen. I'm sorry, I'm not very pronunciation. And uh, and. We'll be talking about uh, more than Moran. I won't read the whole title, no, okay. but uh, please. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, the providers of the free open, open data first and the funders. And so as species dynamics, if you think of these different examples, have large ecosystem sun consequences, but they're not completely understood. So you can think of paleo, um, megafauna extinctions or the cod or even the dynamics of um, outbreaks like uh, Ebola. And so the question is why do they fluctuate in space and time and if we can understand these fluctuations I mean we can manage them better. And uh, in a lot of these cases we need to use models because in these very large scale um, we can't really have experiments. And so for my PhD, I studied the spruce budworm on the bottom right here, which is a very well-studied species, but it also has very large outbreaks. And so here, I'm going to show you what this, these outbreaks looked like. So this is eastern Quebec, and uh, the red is where this spruce budworm is um, attacking the forests. As you can see here, the, the, the needles of the uh, conifers become red, and so it's very easy to spot this from space. So the red parts is where there's a, a spruce bottom outbreak, and the green parts is basically everything else. And so this is for each year. That was in 1968. And then during the 70s, there was a large outbreak that covered pretty much the whole of Quebec and other areas. And then during the 90s, it was it's basically a rare species if you go into the forest. And then currently, we're in another outbreak. And so they, they happen every much every 30 years. And so this is what it looks like. The larva is what just causes the herbivory, and then it turns into moth, we can, which can disperse very far, over 500 kilometers. And so the last outbreak, it destroyed almost 200 cubic meters 
million cubic meters of wood, which for the non-foresters is roughly 5,000 years toilet paper use in Canada. <laughs> so it has a big impact and this is why there's uh, many different ways to try and stop it. So for example, in the 50s, at the, when the outbreak was happening, they sprayed DDT. So, so previous models of the spruce butterworm are often population models, and that's probably why I'm in the population section, where they've followed uh, in one area the dynamics, so how many larvae there are in each branch. But since the, these densities vary so much from basically nothing to up to 100 larvae per branch, it's really, it's such an extreme population um, differences that we tried instead to make a metapopulation model. So instead of modeling the density of the spruce budworm, we modeled the effect of it on the forest. So it becomes kind of an insect disturbance model or an epidemiological model where you don't say, oh, I have 50 million bacteria inside me today. You say, I see, feel so sick. So instead, we model the defoliation cost. And just to define outbreaks, so in this case, I, I defined it as synchronized defoliation. So if you imagine two stands, there will be no outbreaks, so low density of the spruce budworm in one year, and then the next year, you would have an outbreak at many places at the same time. And so there's different hypotheses for this. So one is that it's dispersal, so an outbreak starts somewhere in one patch, and then it disperses around. And because it can fly so far and it reaches such high densities, this is quite a plausible explanation. And another one is the climate synchronizes the stand. So if it's warm, for example, in two stands at the same time, uh, then an outbreak will be caused everywhere, even without dispersal. And it's known that there's a high spatial autocorrelation in climate values. So it's also a plausible hypothesis. So the aim of my study was to investigate these two hypotheses, if and how they can affect outbreaks. And to do so, I used a metapopulation model. And it's interesting because that metapopulation concept was <laughs> was uh, developed for pest control. The metapopulation model was developed for pest control, but it's never really been applied to pest. Maybe. And to do so, I coupled uh, statistical and simulation models. So I used this available data, spatial-temporal defoliation data, and also climate data in the same location and in different years uh, for each patch and each year. And then first I constructed statistical models to see <coughs> what kind of dispersal kernel uh, could be found in this uh, defoliation and what the climate drivers were. So what was the climate in the previous year to an outbreak happening in a location? And then to really test the Morin effect, the spatial autocorrelation, I used simulation models with these same uh, statistical relationships. And so first uh, predicted a dispersal kernel that we had an introduction to and uh, so in red, you can see the defoliation in one year, and in pink is the defoliation in the next year. So you can, count, you can see how far, on average, does the defoliation spread. And so I tested different distances, different um, decay of this d probability, and I found that a medium distance dispersal uh, was the, the best one. And then I also tested which climate variable, so which which climate in the previous year had the biggest effect on, an, on a new outbreak occurring in one location. And so I tested different climate variables and the best one was the maximum temperature of the warmest period in the previous year, which is logical because insects are quiet, they like warm temperatures. So on the x-axis you can see the temperature, so the optimum for an outbreak occurring was around 19 degrees. And um, in the black line, you can see the, the statistical model, the GLM for this. So now I kind of 
knew what the climate and the dispersal um, kernel looked like, and so I compared and see which kind of model was the best in predicting the outbreaks in each year, in each patch. And so the model with all climate variables and dispersal was the best, and then it was all the different climate variables and uh, dispersal was also pretty good as a single variable, but it was, uh, it, at least it was much better than there's just one climate variable. So that, ex that shows that many different climate variables can interact to produce this defoliation. And so then I used uh, these statistical relationships uh, as a model. So this is the same landscape where I run this model in. And, uh, but in each, so I start with the same initial condition, but then I have, and then I have the same climate. And so in each patch, and in each year, I, I calculate, okay, what's the probability, what's the climate, what's the probability of an outbreak? And I look around, okay, according to the defoliation around it, what's the probability of an outbreak dispersing to that cell? And so it starts with the same as the real data, And then um, we can see that we do get a lot of the landscape that is infected, but there's not, you can see it's not as spatially uh, clumpy as the real data. And also in the um, dotted line is the real. So you can see that there, it's almost as big during the outbreak, but also it was more constant throughout time and it wasn't clumpy enough. And so it means that well, our interpretation is that there's still other mechanisms that also cause outbreak, which is logical. And then so finally, to test the Morin effect, uh, we could randomize uh, the climate. So that was using simulations using the real climate, which is the examples of here, the climate variable in space and in time. And so to test the autocorrelation, the role of spatial and temporal autocorrelation, we randomized it. So it's keeping the same values, but just changing them either in space or in time between years. And then I could run simulation models again and observe what kind of dynamics happened. And if, for example, if a big part of this was caused by spatial autocorrelation, then removing it would cause outbreaks that looked completely different and vice versa. And so this, each thin line here is a simulation and the dotted lines is the real outbreaks. And so when I removed um, spatial autocorrelation in the top line, the outbreaks looked almost the same, well, closer to the real outbreaks than when I removed the temporal autocorrelation. And so that means that it's uh, really the order of the years is very important for making these large outbreaks. So three, four years of very suitable climates cause these large-scale uh, outbreaks at the same time. Whereas if I remove the order of the years, sometimes there were big outbreaks and sometimes there were small ones, um, but not at the same time as the real outbreaks. And so the conclusion would, is, is that this seems similar to what other people have found, uh, which they've called the enhanced Morin effect, that it's also the, not only the spatial autocorrelation, but it could also be a temporal autocorrelation that causes these big outbreaks. <coughs> and this has been shown in, um, in theory and also in experiments with the microcosms. So it's interesting that this could also be sh occur in nature. And we were able to study this because we made the spatial temporal metapopulation model that was completely parameterized from the observed uh, data. And it's interesting to have this kind of dispersal kernel to, to understand you know, how can we minimize uh, outbreaks. So we know if dispersal is important and how it looks like, then we can make a kind of management to minimize dispersal and outbreaks. But this isn't the whole story because you saw that the simulation were less clumped in space and time. So, thank you. Thanks very much, Hedvig. Uh, we've got time for some questions. Uh, at the back there.
sensitive is the plot fault to the resulting plumb temperature that you would predict from the model if you were to choose a much more restricted dispersion uh, I actually haven't tried that. Oh no, I have tried that. <laughs> um, well, the problem with the dispersal kernel for the spatial clumpiness was that it was just too low. So for example, even if you're very close to an outbreak, it was only 0.5 probability of dispersal, which means that it's not clumpy enough. But, but if you look at the data, it looks like it's very clumpy. But actually, in, in some locations, the defoliation didn't take place one year, and then it took place the next year. So the probability is 0.5, but and so that, and that's what my model simulates but there's something else that makes these episodic uh, dispersal. So yes, I tried it with a short little distance, but it still wasn't clumpy enough. Did you have a question? Yeah. So could it be something about the, um, the actual response of the, of the species to the environmental factors? Yeah. It's missing. So in, in other work, I've also looked at natural enemies. So for example, there's a large, there's many parasitoids that also control it. So during outbreak periods, there's no very low if parasitism, but during the endemic periods there is. So we're thinking there's some kind of spatial pattern of interacting species. But I also looked at forest uh, type, but that didn't have a large effect uh, locally. Because forest doesn't also change much in time. Anything's missing. One more quick question. Mm -hmm. Have you considered that perhaps there's a two stage model needs to happen here? You've got diffusion going on with your clumpiness in your larger stage, and then which you measure population, larger dispersal in, in, in the adult models quite often. But particularly when I looked at your year on year data, where things were, that it looked like you had diffusion out in, in a particular direction. But not in another direction. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely think there's many more things going on. So it'd be interesting if people could study these. Well, either the demography of the species, and people do look at that too. Like the early stage, the density of that has a large effect, or also other species. But yeah, there's definitely some sort of spatial patterning. Okay, let's thank Hedvig once more. And <laughs> Our next speaker is Charlotte de Vries, and uh, going to be talking about demography when history matters. So, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, I did this work with Hal Caswell at the University of Amsterdam, and the funding was from the European Research Council. I have a tendency to speak at frequencies beyond the audible range when I'm nervous. If I do that, feel free to kind of wave at me and I'll to try to take a breath and slow down. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be talking to you about demography when history matters. First, I'll introduce this idea of history dependence and how it relates to state variables in ecology. Um, then I'll show you how to incorporate it into matrix, matrix models, uh, discuss some analysis that we can do with it, and show you a case study. Um, so. Most, almost all models in ecology assume something that's called the Markov property about the system that they're modeling. So the Markov property states that the future state of your system depends only on the current state. So the, provided you've chosen the right state variable, all you need to know is what's happening right now, and the past doesn't matter. So for example, in a simple lotka volterra model, just the top one there, um, you just need to know how many predator and prey you have right now, and then you can predict the future. Uh, and this is true for both continuous time models and discrete time models. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to discuss deviations from that uh, assumption uh, in discrete time models, so matrix models. Um, so an example of an individual history state that might be important is prior reproductive success. Um, in plants, for example, and in trees, this can be used as a proxy for current research storage, resource storage. Um, so current resource storage 
can be a very important state variable for determining your survival and reproduction, but it can be hard to measure without damaging individuals. And therefore, you could use a prior state as a proxy for a current state. Um, but also in mammals that have several years of parental care, prior reproductive success could be important. Um, another example of a prior state that might be relevant is prior size, uh, especially in trees, for example. If they're not growing, then that can mean they don't have enough light or something else is wrong. And so growth can be an important prior variable that can determine survival and reproduction. So uh, first I'll remind you of how we built a matrix model, a first order normal matrix model. Um, and the first step in doing that is choosing the relevant ice state variable. Uh, so examples of these are age, size, stage. From these, um, this ice state variable, we construct a population vector which we then project forward with a population projection matrix, A. Um, and A can be split into a part that deals with transitions among states by existing individuals, which is U, and a part that deals with fertility, F. And so again, the default assumption here is that all the relevant information about an individual's history is captured by these I state variables. But of course, there is always some variation left in vital parameters beyond that which is captured by the states that we've chosen. And this is often referred to as a heterogeneity or an observed heterogeneity. And so history, individual history, is just another source of this kind of heterogeneity. Um, and so we're not the first people to have thought about this. Um, a group in Montpellier has uh, used capture recapture data to test for the presence of memory. Um, it was data on overwintering sites of Canadian geese, and they found evidence of memory in that system, and they uh, fit a second order model to it. And then Johan Erlen has also uh, fit a second order model to, um, for a perennial plant, that Tiris Vernus. And we actually used the data from Johan Erlen in the model he created for our case study later. So I'll get back to that. Um, so I haven't really defined yet what exactly I mean by history yet. Um, so we're just looking at one time step in the past, so short-term history. Um, and then we're, we've sort of categorized different types of history into two things. So the simplest kind of prior stage, prior condition that you might consider is where you just consider the full prior stage. So if you have S current stages, for example, um, 100 sizes, then you have 100 times 100, so 10,000 possible second order states, because it's all the transitions. However, that might be way more information than you need. So for example, like I was saying, in trees, growth is what's important. So then the only thing you need to know is whether an individual grew, shrank, or stayed the same. So you just need pro three prior conditions. And these are a function of both the prior stage and the current stage. Um, so I've shown an example here for the case of growing with three size classes. Um, so the columns are your prior stage, the rows are your current stage, and you've gone through this transition. And so along the diagonal, you have stasis above the diagonal shrinking and below the diagonal growing. Um, so our framework allows for the incorporation of any kind of function that you could come up with that might be relevant for your species. Um, however, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the top one, where we just the simplest case, because the math is the easier to explain. And yeah. So what do we do? What's the aim? We start with longitudinal data, a time series of data. And then rather than just having one transition matrix U and one fertility matrix F, we get a transition matrix U for every prior stage, a prior condition dependent transition matrix. Um, and the same for the fertility matrices. So we get, if we have S prior stages, we get S fertility matrices and S transition matrices. And then the aim of this project was to figure out how we combine all of these into one population projection matrix, A tilde, that will project our full population state vector. Um, so that, this is the formula that we came up with. Um, so the first part is the U tilde, the transition matrices. The second part is fertility. Uh, and so it's a linear combination of those prior condition dependent matrices. And they're put together in such a way that when we project an individual in its future state, we keep track of where it came from. So it's just a fancy bookkeeping, basically. Um, once we have that matrix, we can do, get all the usual demographic results, so reproductive output, 
stable stage distribution, um, pick your favorite demographic analysis. Um, but we can also do something new. Um, so we can do sensitivity analysis, and we can actually analyze the sensitivity of our population growth rate, lambda, to the amount of prior stage dependence that we've put into our model. So it's kind of like analyzing the sensitivity of the population growth rate to the amount of heterogeneity. Um, so we've done that for this case study. Um, so it's the plant is called Latiris vernus. Um, it's a perennial plant. Uh, Johan Ehrland fit, fitted the model with seven stages to it, uh, from seed up to flowering and dormant. And so the full price stages model has 49 um, states, but some of them are impossible because it takes a couple of years before you move from seed to flowering, for example. Uh, so this is an example of some demographic output that you can get from the model. Um, we get a population growth rate that's just below one. You get a stable stage distribution that has current and prior stages. And then this is the funky new thing that we can do. So on the y-axis, we have the population growth rate. And on the x-axis, um, we have the level of heterogeneity in survival and transition rates, so in the U sub i matrices, due to these different prior stages. So what's all the way at the beginning of the, oh wait, is that working? <laughs> so at zero, um, we've taken the average of the use of biomatrices and we've given every individual that those average transition rates, so everyone's the same. So there's no prior stage dependence. And then at one, we have the fully prior stage dependent model. And so in between, we sort of gradually move from no prior stage dependence to full prior stage dependence. And you see that in this case, the population growth rate increases. Um, so what I'd like you to remember from this talk is that historical effects can produce heterogeneity. Um, our framework can incorporate any kind of function of prior stage and current stage. We can analyze the sensitivity of population growth rate to this level of prior stage dependence. Um, and for the case study, we found that lambda increases. Um, we have to try this for a lot more species to figure out whether that's a general trend or a a fluke. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, left a good time for questions. I think there's one at the back. Uh, right at the back there. Oh, yeah. um, just wondering if you have some in prior predictions for species where increasing the dependency on heterogeneity would matter. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I think it's likely that this is a, a thing that would matter for plants and trees. Things that are stationary are in the same position. For example, like light conditions are kind of the same every year, and so that would create some kind of memory in the system, I think. Um, so I've played a little bit with the Canadian geese data too, and it seems like there this it actually has the opposite of a trend. So it, the population growth rate decreases with um, level of heterogeneity, so, yeah. So we had uh, at least one question on this side. Two, I think. Yeah. Maybe two. So, uh, in your example, the Latalis, can, can you intuitively explain why the heterogeneity increases the population growth rate? Um, no. <laughs> it's hard. So, yeah, in a model, because in the second order model, you change your prior stage all the time, right? So there's a lot of mixing in the model. Um, if that wasn't the case, then it would make sense that increasing heterogeneity increases the population growth rate, because then increasing heterogeneity means that the good guys are just winning. Um, but here, because everything is mixing all the time, it's very hard to get some intuition for yeah, how that happens and why that happens. Mm. I. Why would you say it's like a fluctuating environment? <laughs> okay. Um, but that's a fluctuating environment. You some kind of stochastic process, right? Whereas this is very deterministic in a sense. Well, it's a Markov model, so it's 
but the rates are not changing. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the slope of this graph is the sensitivity of... It's the sensitivity, because then that yeah. makes more sense. So I can understand that the population growth rate would be more sensitive to individual heterogeneity is produced by um, you know, more memory in the system, but population growth rate in itself might not increase. Um, but they're, one of them is the derivative of the other one, so they have to be strongly... Um, if it makes sense that the derivative is positive, then yeah, then this has to make sense. <laughs> Vincent. So, so does this mean that all studies that have ignored higher state dependence have uh, hugely underestimated the population growth rate? It suggests that, although it's a little bit more complicated than that, because here we took the average of the second order model, and that will not give you exactly the same vital parameters as going into the field and measuring a first order model. These two things are not identical for several technical reasons. So um, to test that, you would have to compare fitting a first order model and then comparing the results. But I would expect from this that, yeah, that you would be underestimating the population growth rate. We've got time, We've got time for one more question, I think. Um, here, I'm, I'm, it may be wrong, my question, but I'm curious about something. If this is the case, then now um, the identity of the individual that changes matter the most. It's like as you go farther and farther in the past. Yeah. Um, is if an individual does a person do something good and is associated with the outcome on the next iteration of the model, then the identity of the individual is still marginal a lot. And I, I wonder if this. That makes that you underestimate the actual heterogeneity that really exists. You understand? Because you lose that mm -hmm. identity yeah. in the matrix. Um, I think I understand what you're saying. So you could also, instead of fitting a second order model, you could fit a general, um, just don't define what the classes are, but just say there are, there's heterogeneity amongst individuals and fit that model. Um, and I, so I've done that actually for the Canadian geese example, and that fits better. Um, because then you have more flexibility in a way. The second order framework is very restrictive in the way that it, or as a general heterogeneity model. We're going to have to yeah. move on to the next talk. This is a really interesting discussion, and I hope that <laughs> it will continue in the tea break. <laughs>
spatial density of, of individuals around you. And even if you're in a completely random pattern, there's going to be a wide variation in the density experienced by any individual, dependent on whether it happens to be in a cluster or happens to be over by itself, which can determine its fitness. Now, this matters because a lot of processes that are undertaken during the life cycle of a sessile organism are themselves spatially restricted. So organisms might be spatially restricted in the extent over which they're able to mate. For example, how far they can spread their pollen, or how uh, far they can spread their sperm if they're a benthic organism. Likewise, they're often restricted in the distance over which they can disperse, how far their seeds are able to go. And it's these relative ranges of mating and dispersal that I want to focus on today and to show how those can modulate the dynamics of whole populations. And we'll begin just by looking at a basic model of what happens to populations as they increase in density. So what we have on the y-axis is the per capita growth rate of a population as you increase the density in that population. And we're all familiar with the idea that you get negative density dependence at high population densities, and so growth rates decline to a carrying capacity that is a stable equilibrium about here. But in many cases, you also get negative density dependence at low densities, and you end up with this interior critical point here, which is an unstable equilibrium that's often called the alley threshold, which is the point at which the population growth rate falls from being positive to being negative. And this can happen because of all sorts of things, mate finding effects at low densities or an inability to resist um, environmental stress or strong predation can all cause population growth rates to fall below zero at low densities. And from an applied perspective, this is a really important thing to know, because if you're trying to conserve a species, you're trying to sustainably harvest it, you want to keep your population density above that threshold. Alternatively, if you want to manage an invasive species, you might only need to get it down to that alley threshold, and then demographics can wipe out the rest for you. So this is quite a useful parameter to know for any species. The model I've just shown you, it comes from a very simple equation uh, for the dynamics of a system under average density. What we have is uh, row on the left at the rate of change of the population, and beta is the frequency within, with which each individual in the population attempts to mate, and it attempts to mate uh, with individuals that it can reach with a density rho m, so that's its local density of things it can mate with, and then if it successfully mates with something, it tries to disperse an offspring. And that's density dependent as well. Um, rho goes from zero to one, and as the population increases in density, it gets harder and harder to disperse your offspring and to find a place to, um, to live. And so as this goes up, the growth rate of the population declines, which gives us this carrying capacity here. And we add a final term here, which is mu, which is an intrinsic death rate of the population. And that can be predation or environmental stress or harvesting or anything like that. And that's what gives us this dip at the bottom end at low densities. Now, if all of your row terms are the same, you have mean field conditions and nothing is sensitive to local density. But then we add an extra term in, which we've called kappa by reference to Ripley's k function, which represents how the density experienced by an individual differs from average density when it either tries to reproduce or when it tries to disperse. And so what we end up with is a kappa term here, which expresses the local density at time of dispersal, or a kappa term here, which is the local density when it tries to mate, or you can put both into an equation. To give a, these are spatially implicit equations to express how the dynamics of these uh, systems will change once you have a spatial effect in. I'm first going to show you what happens mathematically, and then I'm going to show you some individual based models from real species to show what might happen with uh, syndromes you see in nature. This is the mathematical results for if you increase those kappa terms just by 10%. So you put them up to 1.1, so you're increasing the local density when they try to mate or when they try to disperse by 10%. The solid black line is mean field conditions. Now there's a lot going on here. You've got a change in where the carrying capacity is. You've got a change in the maximum growth rate. But really what I want to point out today is what's going on down here. And you're getting systematic changes in the point of that alley threshold, down at low density. 
And as you ramp up the local density, this is the dispersal term, as you increase the local density when things try to disperse, if you've got short-range dispersal, so they're sensitive to that KD term, then the alley threshold goes up, not by very much, but it does increase. That's because you're getting increased competition for spaces to disperse to. And you don't want the alley threshold to go up because that means it's, it's harder to maintain a stable population. However, if you also have short-range mating, actually the alley threshold goes down. The reason being it becomes easier to mate once you've got lots of things dispersed close around you. So actually the population becomes more stable. And if you just have short-range mating, clustering is implicit in that. If you have short-range mating but long-range dispersal, the clusters would break down. But by having this KM term in there, you keep implicit clusters in there and you get an even stronger effect. Okay, this is the mathematical output. What happens when we look at some real species? We'll start off with a species silver fir, which is a wind-pollinated species. So effectively, when it tries to mate, it experiences average population densities. However, firs are quite restricted in their dispersal because they have relatively large seeds, so they have a limited range in which they can disperse. We might contrast this with another species, a diptrocarp species from Southeast Asia. These have large seeds, they don't disperse great distances, so they're dispersal limited, but they're also pollen limited by dispersal because their dispersers tend to be thrips or small beetles that don't go very far. And we've got good genetic data from populations showing that they're limited in their mating distance too. I then, as a forest ecologist, had to think long and hard to try and come up with a species of tree that had a limited range of mating but long distance dispersal. And I couldn't come up with one. But just recently I've been thinking an awful lot about barnacles. And you'd be surprised, but there's a lot we don't know about barnacles. Uh, Becky Hooper and I published a paper earlier this year showing that they are very highly clustered in their populations, despite the fact that barnacles have uh, norpleid larvae which float freely in the water column. But when those norpleid larvae land on a rock, they become a cyprid larva that deliberately crawls towards other larvae or other barnacles and forms tight clusters. And the reason the acorn barnacle does this, if you know anything about acorn barnacles, is because they have enormous penises and they need physical contact in order to reproduce. So their reproductive range is within 2.5 centimetres, but their dispersal range is effectively unlimited but they've got this extra process in their life cycle, this extra movement step. We therefore have three different syndromes. We have a species that's dispersal limited, a species that's dispersal and mating limited, and one that's just mating limited, with parameters in the literature. And you might contrast those with the mean field case, which is something that, like a grass or a coral, is freely dispersing with small seeds and freely mating. We can normalise these, even though they're over four um, orders of magnitude and distance, normalise them to an individual base model, and it's the relative ranges that really matter. So we have an individual base model which we update on a grid, and it's a standard Monte Carlo process where each individual, every time step, attempts to reproduce. If it successfully, successfully mates, then it attempts to disperse, and if it successfully finds a place to disperse to, then you get a new individual in the population. And we model the dynamics of that with one extra addition for the barnacles, which is that if a barnacle finds a site to uh, disperse to, then that individual moves to an adjacent barnacle within the population, so it generates clusters. And just to see what happens when you mess with the system, when you add stress to it, we vary the intrinsic death rate parameter mu, the rate of harvesting or the rate of death of individuals. The first thing to show you is this is just a pair correlation function for the grids with the diptrocarp with both processes tightly restrained you get very strong clustering with the firs you get strong clustering because of dispersal limitation with the barnacles you get deliberate clustering because they're choosing to and then everything on the mean field is just the spatial average and now this is the killer plot that you need to see which is what happens to the alley threshold when you increase the intrinsic death rate. And remember, you want the alley threshold to be lower, you don't want it to be higher. So for the mean field conditions, you've got the black line there. For the fir trees, you actually end up with an alley threshold above the mean field because they're dealing with this extra problem of 
challenges for space when they try to disperse because they've got restricted dispersal. For the Diptera Cup, it's below, it, the alley threshold drops because they gain the advantage of having mating partners close by after they've dispersed. Although once you get high death rates, those clusters break down, they lose that advantage and actually they're quite sensitive. The populations collapse at a relatively low per capita death rate. And then finally for the barnacles, the alley threshold always stays low because they've got the advantage of local mating partners, but also the advantage of long distance dispersal to get away from the local competition. What does all this mean? Well, first of all, if you've got localised dispersal, you've got mating partners next door to you, so you have an advantage. And the barnacles deliberately choose to maintain clustering uh, by moving towards one another. So really the message I want you to get out of this is, if you're a sessile species like a diptrocarp or like a barnacle, and you've got short distance mating, you need another step in your life cycle or another trait to create clusters in order to maintain stability in your populations. So that's what barnacles and diptrocarp trees have in common. In terms of the applications, I think if you're modeling the dynamics of sessile species, you need to bring in the ranges of processes like dispersal and like mating to properly understand their dynamics. We can use this in an applied context to try and identify species that might be particularly vulnerable to alley effects or to uh, low population densities. And I also think because when most species evolve, they start off at low population densities. And this might tell us something about the realistic parameter space for traits that would allow populations to be resilient and to establish at low densities. If you're interested in this, it's in review of ecological modelling. I'm very happy to share the manuscript with anyone who wants to talk about it. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Marcus. Any questions? You've got two came at exactly the same time. Uh, sorry. You Bill, go for it. Um, imagine a different barnacle that didn't um, move to its, to its nearest neighbour. Presumably, they, it's only so far they can move to the nearest neighbour. What, what would happen to that barnacle? Ooh, um, that's, that's an interesting question. So the, the Norpleids choose areas of rocks based on the local density automatically. So they deliberately go to places where there's a sort of intermediate density, and then they move within that once they get there. But I, I guess you just not get any spatial structure. What I'd like to do, we've done this with acorn, barnac with acorn barnacles, I'd like to compare sperm casting barnacles, because I, I guess that the cost of being aggregated are much lower higher for those, and the benefit's much lower, so you'd imagine they'd have a more dispersed spatial pattern. So, next question. Thanks, Thanks, Mark. Mark. Really cool. Um, so, I guess you're a, you're a woodland person, you said. Um, yeah. <laughs> have you thought about applying your models to maybe a microbial system where you have a very, very, very small mating range, but, you know, potentially enormous dispersal range, and whether that would provide any Hadn't thought about it. If you want to talk later, let's do it. Great. Yep. I understand the next talk's been withdrawn, by the way, so we do have time. We're going to have a 15-minute oh, break. So right, I could be here for ages. <laughs> I'll sing a song. <laughs> I have a question, actually. It's just something I was wondering whether you might consider, or maybe you have considered adding a simulation. If you had a... If you imagine a, a system where, where there's a strong inbreeding cost. So if you mate with kin, then there's a kind of fitness cost. Yeah, so... Does that change your conclusions, do you think? Yes and no. Actually, it's, it's a bit more complicated. So your, your initial thought would be that if you're mating with your kin because they're dispersed close to you, that there'd be an inbreeding cost. Mm. But you also have to bear in mind that tolerance of inbreeding is itself a selected trait. There's evidence across dispersal syndromes, I mean, it's, it's indicative that plants with shorter mechanisms for dispersal are more tolerant of inbreeding. And so I think you've got to look at the context in which the clustering forms. So if you take, say, a tree like Omphalocarpus, which is an uh, African tree, fruits are about this big, dispersed by elephants. If elephants go locally extinct, the Omphalocarpus fruits just go donk on the ground, poor recruitment, but then they're generating clusters, and they're generating clusters in a species that is used to having long-distance dispersal, and that's been lost. In that context, I'd expect there to be a high inbreeding cost. 
Whereas for something that's like an ironwood that's always clustered, you'd expect it to be tolerant of inbreeding and the cost to be lower. Yes, but uh, I imagine that this, these, are, these traits will not be perfectly adapted. So it's, it's quite an interesting interaction. This there. Yeah, so there, there's a cost-benefit trade-off. So if, if there's a greater cost, then that would increase the benefit to dispersal. Mm. But I, I, I think it's, it's a lot more subtle than just assuming yeah. always the next-door neighbour is about one to breed with. But have you considered uh, modelling the evolutionary dynamics if you have different traits kind of alongside? Give us another 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions right now? I'm off the hook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's thank Marcus once more. What? Okay, sorted. <laughs> Do you want yours up already? Yeah, go for it. It's got a nice Is it this one? Yeah. Why not? Okay. Which one? Um, so. Yes, it's the top one. All oh, right. And then you just go through. Hang on, I'll just um, get it up, and then you can practice using it across. Yes. Um, so. What you're expecting? Yeah. Oh, so it should be like that. Yeah, that's great. Top one, and then just. Just right. Don't press the button because it just turns everything off. But you just press it again if you do. And Don't it worry, back. I'll be avoiding that. <laughs> oh God. Thanks very much. I think you would have got Tony. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Talking to I think we first start and then the rest will just come. It's funny I thought they were here. Uh, uh, yes. No, no, in, uh, in Helsinki. With, uh, with the collaborator that Stephen mentioned. So the last guy. Yeah. yeah. Where, where are you? So I can see here. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So our next talk is, is going to be by Julie Miller from University of Glasgow, who's going to tell us about seabirds. Thanks, Julie. Start. Hi, everyone. So I'm Julie. I've just finished first year of my PhD. And uh, this is just some of the work I was doing for it, which I'm going to show you, which was looking at um, additional anthropogenic mortality to seabird populations that are under different regulation of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, drivers. Hopefully by the time I finish this little gif will make a bit more sense. So really the kind of overwhelming underlying background rather to my entire project is this understanding that the offshore renewables industry could confer detrimental effects to our seabird populations through collision habitat loss and or barrier effects, to which ends any new proposed development undergoes an assessment. And one component of this assessment is a estimation of additional mortality that this development may confer. This mortality is estimated over 25 years, which is the operational lifespan of a wind farm. And assessors have several different tools at their disposal that they may use to look at this mortality and determine whether or not it's going to be detrimental and or negligible to a seabird population. And one that they use is this potential biological removal. Really, this is just a calculation that you can independently apply to any given population that will return a threshold value of individuals that you can remove from that population, above which your population might be likely to be in decline. 
So what the assessors will do then is they'll take their 25-year estimate, compare it to the 25-year uh, uh, PBR threshold, and then perhaps the development may or may not get consent, depending on what, how this compares. But we are, obviously we understand that our populations are under uh, regulation from extrinsic and ex intrinsic drivers. So our environment, for example, might um, affect whether or not our seabirds uh, even try to breed in any given year. It can also impact on their chick growth rate development and their fledgling success. And also the environment can impact fitness and survival at all other kind of age classes too. Density dependence, an intrinsic regulator, can also impact our populations. For example, at higher densities, there might be an increased resource competition, which may impact again on fitness and potentially also survival. So really this led to this question of what impact can additional mortality have to our populations that are under different combinations of this intrinsic and extrinsic regulation. So to look at this, I needed some study populations and I had several criteria I wanted to meet when choosing these populations. So firstly, I needed quality vital rate estimates and I wanted these to be empirically derived from the populations I was interested in, not taken from elsewhere as, po as proxy. I also wanted empirically derived historical time series population estimates for each of the populations. I wanted to look at diversity of species, so looking across a few life histories. And also I wanted to look at species that were going to be vulnerable to offshore development also. So to which ends, I chose a black-legged kittiwake breeding population from the Isle of May, northern gannet breeding population from the Bass Rock, and common guillemot breeding population again from the Isle of May. So I had my study species and their data that, they, that I had for them also. So the next step was to build a projection matrix. So I used a kind of classic matrix, uh, matrix population model. I included demographic stochasticity from drawing from binomial distributions. And I included a term for density dependence as a function which I applied only to fecundity. And I included environmental stochasticity as an error term which I applied to fecundity and also survival at each of the age classes. So that's my projection matrix. Now I need to determine or derive some sort of range of values for these two parameters for my strength of density dependence and my environmental stochasticity. So I took that, uh, those projection models for each of my population and I fitted them to that historical time series that I was talking about in a Bayesian frame, framework. And I asked this framework to estimate for me those two parameters. And when I analysed my posteriors, I took the ranges as the lower and to the upper 95% credible intervals for each of these parameters for each of my populations. So therefore, this is a slight visualization of that. On the x-axis, I have my strength of density dependence. From the origin out, there's my lower to upper 95% credible intervals. And again, the same for the y-axis, but for environment. So when I split that up, I can get lots of different combinations, pairwise combinations of these values. And if I populate the, my <clears throat> matrix model with these values, I can get lots of different simulations. So I do have, I've got my projection matrix model. I've got lots of different ranges of values for my populations. Now I need to apply, or calculate rather, some additional mortality to apply to my populations. And this is back to that PBR that I mentioned very briefly at the start. This is the kind of bare bones equation of a PBR. I'm not really gonna focus on anything here too greatly, rather than this last term here, this FR, the precautionary factor. In industry, they use this for additional precaution in assessments, and really it just has a proportional effect on the overall PBR uh, calculation. So if I was to run a PBR on a population of gannets, for example, and it comes back saying I can re remove 400 individuals, that's an FR factor of one. If I apply an FR factor of 0.1, I'll only remove 40. So you can see that how it, how it affects the, <clears throat> the numbers you're actually removing. So I wanted to look across four scenarios and a sliding scale of increasing additional mortality and decreasing precautions. So I wanted to look at a baseline, which was no mortality, then uh, FR factors of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1, respectively. So I've got my models. I've got my range of values for my two parameters of interest and I have my mortality scenarios, how am I going to quantify my impact? So I'm going to project my populations with different pairwise combinations of these values um, of regulation. 
I'm then going to apply my mortality scenarios. And in the 25 year period that I, after I apply these mortality scenarios, which is the consensual basis of the wind farm, I'm going to take a mean population estimate and compare that with a 25 year mean population pre additional mortality. And then I'm going to record this impact as change. So has my population increased or decreased? So on to my results. Um, there's a lot of plots I'm going to show you, so I'm just going to hover on this slide for a little bit because they all look the same in terms of construct, but not in content. So always on the x-axis is the strength of density dependence, again, taken from those 95% credible intervals. Always on the y for every plot is my strength of environmental stochasticity. For my simulations, I split these into 51 increments on each axis, which gave me 2,600 pairwise combinations of values for me to simulate my, my populations with, and that's what the body of the plot represents. The colour system here represents that impact change, so that the, the, the difference between the 25-year mean post-mortality scenario compared to the pre-mortality scenario. And I have light oranges, yellows, and whites are increases. Darker oranges through to reds are, de are declines. Um, I also added a little contour to try and help delineate any patterns I may or may not see in my results. So that's what all of the graphs will kind of look like in terms of construct. So moving on to my results. Um, for my baseline, I'm always going to have, by the way, <laughs> northern gannets are always going to be in the top row, common guillemots are always going to be in the middle, and my black-legged kitty wakes are always going to be in the bottom row. So on the baseline, this is a no additional mortality scenario. Really, for all of the species, there's no great discernible pattern. There's kind of stochastic gains and losses across all combinations of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, values. As I... Add my mortality, I'm going to focus first of all on my northern gannets, which are in the top row here. So I put on my first most precautionary F factor, which is the least additional mortality, and you start to see a change. You can see those populations in the top right, where's my pointer? Top right here, uh, which have the higher values of environmental stochasticity and uh, are over at the higher side of strength of density dependence start to show a sensitivity to the mortality. You can also begin to see a, le a right to left movement of decline also with those populations that have increased strength of density. And as I decrease precaution and increase mortality in the other two scenarios for minor, oh, how did I do that? Go back, sorry, <laughs> for Northern Gannet. Uh, you can see this effect kind of amplified and you start to see the sort of strong delineation of sensitivities of combinations. Looking at the first additional mortality of my common guillemot, you see a different pattern from the northern gannet. Uh, you can see that this population is more sensitive to higher environmental stochasticity values in the in the context of this additional mortality. And you can see the sort of top-down effect of um, decline happening here, again amplified here, and also uh, sensitivity increasing in, as strength of dens density dependence increases. For the kitty wake, we have again a different baseline pattern, uh, uh, a different pattern in the first additional mortality where you can see that these populations are highly sensitive to higher environmental stochasticity values. And as these uh, mortality scenarios are increased and precaution is decreased, you can see the effect of decline on the population. Now, one thing I didn't mention here is that these populations are actually reseeded, so they're not entirely closed populations. I've not let them run down to extinction and I've repopulated them with, a, with one pair every, every year. And that's because I did this study initially on closed populations, which is how industry would model it and I got these results. So you can see the sort of extreme uh, versions I'm getting of the, of the previous slides. And really I did that reseeding to try and sort of add more realism because we know they function as metapopulations and to try and have a look and see what kind of patterns were going on in amongst these species. But this is what, how industry would look at this, this problem. So really, what am I looking at here? What is the, what is the point of all this? So we don't know what uh, environment our populations are going to be subject to in the future. We know that they're likely to experience more extreme weather events. 
uh, and we understand that climate change is occurring. We also can't quantify strength of density dependence during an assessment, and that's also likely to change over time and space. Uh, so to look at this intrinsic and extrinsic variability might highlight sensitivities. But also, this PBR that I was discussing, uh, that I've used as my measure of mortality, even with the recovery factor of 1.0, it's supposed to be a precautionary measure. It's the tool that they will use to assess. Um, so perhaps this research shows, not only in the closed one, which is a dire picture, but also in the receded one, that perhaps in its current usage, this PBR isn't uh, fit for purpose in its current uh, term for industry. So really the take home message is that perhaps we should be considering uh, different combinations of density and environment uh, with our populations under assessment and it might confer more rigor to environmental impact assessments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. We've got time for a couple of questions. One at the back there. Hi. Uh, so that population, I uh, probably didn't focus on this very much, so that population on the Isle of May are, have been in serious decline and they're in decline across the whole of the UK. Um, they've had serious crashes in their food availability um, all around the UK with their prey species moving north and or collapsing due to overfishing. So because of their life histories as well and the way that they breed, perhaps that's what why the, the empirically derived values that I got from those posterior distributions highlights extreme sensitivities for them from the historical time series. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. No, it was the the mean vital rate for fecundity for each of them. Yes, I'm interested in how that interacted with the density dependence as to whether whether when whether whether with the density dependence being low density mm -hmm. would actually increase the rate above that or whether having a higher density would only decrease that rate. Um no we did see it I think that's what you mean. Yeah. How you did it. So you can. It's interesting that high density dependence. Mm -hmm. Where it was always. Comes in as a negative. Yeah. Because if you're at a lower population, mm -hmm. if that was the mean, you'd have thought that potentially you would have an increased reproductive rate. Right. That, that's did did get increases. I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is what you mean, but I'll highlight it anyway. Uh, over here in the right hand side, so we have like 100% increases here, which is sort of, uh, I assume, some kind of alley effect, which is right over in the baselines from um, strength. Is that what you mean? Where we've got increase. No. Um. Okay. <laughs> Probably. Okay. Thanks very much, Judy. We're going to have to move on. Fine. So if you have Thank more you. questions, please take them in the break. And let's thank Judy once more. <laughs> and our next speaker is Louise Massal. Yep. And Louise is going to talk about uh, phenotypic plasticity. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm working uh, on phenotypic plasticity and resource polymorphism and how the, their interaction can affect uh, ecological dynamics. So what I call resource polymorphism is that when you look at the life cycle of an individual, you might uh, see that individual takes different, uh, different resources to, uh, get, to go through their life. So for example, if you look at the tiger salam salamander uh, developmental pathway, uh, they have two different environments that they use. Uh, as eggs and juvenile, they will use an aquatic environment and then they will go through metamorphosis and then they will uh, use a terrestrial environment as adults. But sometimes when environment, uh, environmental uh, changes arrives, 
Some individuals might choose to not undergo metamorphosis and stay into the aquatic environment as adults and only undergo uh, sexual maturation. And those, uh, those changes have a huge impact on uh, a population dynamics. So uh, we want to assess how this is happening and how this is uh, um, having an impact on population dynamic. Another example is um, in the space food toad. Uh, they also have two different environments. As an uh, eggs and tadpole, they are, in, they are in an aquatic environment, and as adults, they're in a more terrestrial environment. But sometime during the juvenile stage, some of the tadpoles uh, might change their diet and become more car carnivory than the others. And that also has a huge impact on population dynamics. So my question is, first of all, how does those resource polymorphism in different stages might affect the economical dy dynamics of a population? And then how that does phenotypic plasticity has an impact on those ecological uh, dynamics? So how do I model resource polymorphism? I use a size structure model uh, as a, for the individual. So my individual will start as, at a certain size at birth. Uh, start feeding on the first resource, then I keep growing until a, thresh a size threshold where it has the it, it has the choice to stay on the first resource until uh, until it reaches the maturation th size threshold, or it will uh, switch during juvenile stage to a, a second resource and use this second resource until maturation. When uh, individual reach maturation size it will use the third resource, which is a separate resource only for adults. I use a net production mod model uh, for my individual, which is a bioenergetic model. They uh, use, they ingest some uh, energy from the environment. They will use this energy first to uh, pay any maintenance costs. And the remaining energy will be used only for growth in the juvenile stage and for growth and reproduction in the adult stage. For the remaining of the talk, I will uh, show you what's, what is happening with my uh, biomass population for the two different strategies. So either staying uh, for the, on the same resource the whole juvenile stage or switching to a new uh, resource during the juvenile stage. And I will show, you, show it to you for a different uh, productivity of the first, uh, the first resource for the juvenile. So here you see the, only the adult biomass. And what you see is that at equilibrium, um, when I change my productivity of the first journal research, then I have the two strategies that remain and that are successful in the population at equilibrium, what I call successful, they reach adulthood and they are able to reproduce. Uh, but this is actually happening only when I have a very low productivity for the adult resource. When I have a very high productivity for the adult resource, what is happening is that I have two different possible uh, outcomes at equilibrium. Um, this is still the biomass for the adults, either the coming from the switchers uh, juvenile or the stayers juvenile. So if I uh, start with a very low productivity of the, juvenile, the first juvenile resource, what's happening is that I only have the switchers that, are, uh, that will be able to mature and become adults and reproduce in the population. And if you look at the uh, same equilibrium for the stayers, there is no biomass in the stayer, uh, in the, in the stayer uh, adults. And that is because they, they never reach um, maturation. But if I start from a very high productivity of my juvenile, uh, first juvenile resource, then it's the other way around, is that the stayers, the one that only use the first resource, that will be able to become adults and reproduce in the population, whereas I have no uh, adults coming from the switchers strategy. So if I look at a more broad uh, picture of what's happening at the equilibrium in my population. Uh, so I look at different productivities of the first juvenile resource, and now I also look at different productivities of the adult resource. Then I, case, I, I, I can see two different scenarios. First, I have a very low productivity for the adult resource. This is the first uh, figures I've, I've showed you at equilibrium. What's happening is that if I have very low productivity for the adults, then uh, the adults won't have 
a lot of resource to use for reproduction. So in your population, in your population, you have low reproduction, so low amount of juvenile, and then they can use both resources. So resource one or resource two, and they can both uh, make it to maturation because there is not much competition for resource. And that is whatever the productivity of the first resource is. On the other hand, if I have a very high productivity of the adult's resource, then it means that they have a lot of food, so they can use, uh, they can use it for making a high reproduction pool in your population, which means you have a lot of juvenile in the juvenile stage, which means a lot of competition. And then uh, what's going to happen to your individual uh, really much depends on what strategy they will use. So if I have a very low productivity of the uh, first juvenile resource, the one that choose to stay on this resource, they will experience a lot of competition compared to the ones that have uh, switched to the other resource, and they won't make it to maturation. On the other hand, if I have a very high productivity for this first resource, then that's the one that choose the strategy to stay on this first resource that will have enough resource uh, despite the competition to reach maturation and contribute to the population. So that was uh, what was happening without plasticity. It's already quite complex. You have two different possibilities, uh, two, two different outcomes. So now I will add plasticity to the choice of switching or staying during the, the juvenile stage. So before, you had the same probability to stay or choose whatever uh, the environment was. Now I, um, I model the plasticity as the probability to switch, resource, uh, the, switch to the second resource at a certain size threshold. So if the resource one is very high compared to the resource two when, you, when the individual wants to switch, then this probability of switching is very low they will try to remain on the resource that is the most productive. On the other way, on the, uh, on the other side, if uh, the resource uh, two is very high compared to the resource one, then uh, they have a very high probability to switch. So what's happening if I look at the same pictures? So I try to look at what's going to happen to the, to the equilibrium, to the population, when I, I change the productivity of the uh, first juvenile resource and uh, the, I change also the productivity of the adult resource. Uh, it looks like nothing's happening. Uh, it's not exactly the case. So if I look at the upper parts, so high productivity of the adult resource, so a lot of reproduction, a lot of competition in the uh, juvenile stage. Yeah, that's true. Nothing's happening. It's exactly the same. Uh, it's exactly the same situation. Two different equilibrium, and that, that will depend on where, where, what is the productivity of the first juvenile resource, and what is your, uh, your strategy. But now if I look at the uh, lower part uh, of, my, of my figure, which is a very low productivity for the adult resource, so low reproduction, uh, not much competition in the juvenile stage, uh, with, with um, uh, with uh, plasticity, what is happening is that I still have the coexistence of the two strategy, but the way they use uh, the way they use the resource is somewhat a bit more efficient in the sense that at very high productivity for this, the first uh, juvenile resource, then you will see more of those individuals that will stay on the resource that we use the strategy to stay because there is just more food. So it's a bit different. Uh, they, they have a better way to use the resource. So finally, uh, what's happening in the model? When the population is limited by its reproduction, both of the strategies are success, successful in the population at equilibrium. Uh, the feeding strategy uh, composition of the population changes when the, the, feeding, when the choice is plastic. Um, with plasticity, the dominant strategy will be the one uh, that uses the most productive general resource. When the population is limited by maturation, uh, only one uh, strategy is successful in the population at equilib equilibrium, and uh, the, the equilibrium state depends on the productivity of the, the first juvenile resource and that is compared to the alternative juvenile resource. And the plasticity does not affect uh, this uh, population composition and dynamic. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Louise. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Because increasing the amount of resource make that vanish. So this one you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I chose to only show the the first resource and the third the adult resource because there is no uh, effect of the second resource. What the only effect is uh, the the, the um, vertical line some, somewhat that you can see on, between only the switchers and the bi-stability region uh, slowly shifts as you increase the productivity of the the alternative juvenile. Uh, the range of coexistence will not change. It's, you, still have, you still have some coexistence, but it's not going to increase or, or anything. It's just going to switch this, this part where you switch from only switchers to by stability. I was just wondering if you considered uh, environments where the ratio of resources is changing stochastically or, or maybe cyclically? Not yet. That's maybe the next step. Uh, well, I also want to work on, on evolution of the switch and the plasticity right. in the switch, but that might be also um, something I, I would be very inter interested in. It's like, what's going to happen if I have some stochasticity in my environment? The outcome might be a bit, maybe not on the ecological part, but on the evolutionary parts, M might be a bit different. I don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. Mm. Um, there are no more questions. We think we should move on to our last speaker. Let's thank Louise once more. <laughs> our last speaker is Catherine Preedy, okay. who's going to talk to us about uh, aphid parasitoid systems. And Fantastic. Okay. Let me hide that for a moment. Okay. So, I'm Catherine, I will try and keep myself brief, being this is the end of quite a long day. Um, but, this is back to work I was doing years and years ago. Um, I got into a conversation with Ali Carley, who's based at the Joan Tottenham Institute in Dundee. Um, who does a lot of work with aphids, and she had got to looking at um, a particular symbiont called Hamatonella defensa, and could not understand why she was seeing this in lots and lots of aphids, <coughs> but also not seeing it in lots and lots of aphids of the same population, when it in many species of aphids, confers resistance to attack by parasitoids. And at that point, despite lots of work by lots and lots of labs, nobody could find any discernible fitness clubs. This does not make sense in any kind of niche theory or competition theory or anything like that. Um, so having worked with Ali before, um, I'm thinking this would be a jolly nice excuse to do some work together again. We thought we'd have a quick look and see what was going on and whether there was anywhere we could go with it. Um, and it's, it's quite embryonic there, so I do have to hold my hands up to that, but it produced surprisingly packed results, which we're hoping now to take forward. The, the joy of working so close with you at Valley is that we, we have polytons and closed environments to do stuff with and test <coughs> stuff and feed things backwards and forwards. So that's the background. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with them, parasitoids, uh, the, the oid bit is about things being deadly, and parasite, well, they, they live on so. And there's something between, a combination between a parasite and a predator. <coughs> They're like a parasite in that they only require a single host at a time. 
And it tends to be in the juvenile stage, but they have a single host. And then in parasites, well, we have lots of them. They can be symbiotes. <coughs> we need them. We wouldn't survive without them. But they only need one of us to survive on. And in that, that case, the host may actually survive. You think about a predator, well, the prey invariably dies as a result of the interaction with it. Um, but a predator will tend to consume multiple organisms. The thing about a parasitoid is, this is an example of them, is the mother laying its egg in aphids. This is, in point of fact, is actually um, lenturic camosens, which is, but, um, but these are, these are uh, potato aphids, if I remember rightly. It lays the egg, and it may kill the aphid or lay the egg immediately. More often, the aphid survives until the point where the eggs, uh, they develop as larvae and they're ready to mature as adults. And then this happens. Um, and this is, as a number of you may recognize, as a scene out of Alien, where the alien, it's laid its egg in the body. And when it emerges, the poor host sees the worst of it. Um, and it is the classic example of a parasitoid. So, the kind of hosts we're looking at are potato aphids, pea aphids. They're important agricultural pests. They're really important. Pain in the neck. The potato aphids came from North America, but they've been around in the UK since the early 1900s. They're a pain in the neck. They feed on everything. They're probably the ones you see in your garden when you get green fly. Um, 20 plus plant families, 200 plant species. They're a pain because they do direct feeding damage. You get holes, you get mangled bits of stem and whatnot. Um, but they also transmit viruses, such as PL bark RV. Um, and here's an example of your potato aphid. And here's an example of them infesting uh, a leaf. Um, but we also are interested in pea aphids, which are globally distributed. Again, they're a bit more specialist. They like legumes, um, but they do horrendous economic damage to crops, both in terms of damage to productivity, but also in terms of making uh, it impossible to sell various products as well, because they're cosmetically damaged. Um, they also vector viruses. Um, we like pea aphids because we can do lots of them. They're well understood. We've studied them intensely in the lab. We can culture them. Um, and here's an example of a pea aphid with lots of little baby pea aphids kicking around the place. Um, so they're well studied. We understand them extremely well in terms of the various strains and genotypes. Um, and they are a real pain in the neck. Um, and to that end, um, people are interested in being able to control them without having to use chemicals. Um, in general, unlike many insects, particularly the pea aphids, which sort of are interesting, they're born as nymphs in the summer season. Two to five in a day. But, you know, we understand what they do quite well. They're not, they're not bit like many of these sort of... Um, insects which lay eggs and will produce thousands of eggs with a very high mortality <coughs> where they actually produce live nymphs. They're approximately 12 days from birth of the nymph to reproductive maturity and about 80% of nymphs will survive to that point um, in the absence of parasitoids. Um, and this is well studied both in polytunnels in the lab in the field because they've been around for such a long time, and pea aphids in particular have, um, uh, have a two-stage two stage history of the year. One born at the beginning of the year will tend to uh, have no wings, and then towards the end of the year, then they will get wings and disperse. But it does mean that through the season, we can monitor survival. Um, adults survive 10 to 20 days. And the point about the fact that they don't have wings is that the nymphs and adults compete for space. So you have a single competing population here. Um, and then they're dormant over winter and the emerge in the summer. 
and they, they are like the green flies in your gardens. So, we understand them quite well. They're an economic pain in the neck. Um, it's not that great in terms of having to spray, particularly in um, inaccessible areas or if people are going down the organic route, um, just in terms of cost. So biocontrol is a big thing. Um, and parasitoids are the natural biocontrol. Um, you can buy them and you can release them in your greenhouses should you choose to do so. Um, they're common natural enemies. We quite like them because we're not necessarily going down the route of introducing strange species. We're just enhancing something that's already there. Um, the Phidias ervi are supplied commercially for biocontrol. And they are, not to jargon any words, quite about them. They essentially what they do is they lay their egg in the um, lay their egg in the nymph, um, and it essentially what it likes to do is it hides from the immune system until it can develop such that it and it basically eats the eats the caterpillars from the inside out. Um, but the point is, it needs to hide from the immune system until it's strong enough not to be nicked by antibodies and the like. And it, essentially, the last thing it eats of the caterpillar is the digestive system. So um, when it does that, it mummifies the aphid, and a few days later it emerges as a parasitoid, and you get one parasitoid from each, um, uh, for, from each caterpillar. So this has been quite extensively studied and the timings monitored. We, a recent PhD student, looked at it in depth and looked at superparasitism as well. They have strong preference for the nymphs rather than the adults. They survive a few days before they mummify. Again, about 12 days from oviposition to emergence and reproductive maturity. Adults survive 10 to 20 days. So the point about this is it's about almost identical to scale to the nymphs. Okay, so we can't ignore the development times entirely. In lab conditions, they parasitize about 60 nymphs an hour, but once you let them in the field and they've got to search for the blessed things, you can bring it down to an average of more like one to two a day. What happens is they can go days and find nothing, and then they find a leaf with aphids and they go for a lot. Um, so... Hamiltonella defensa is the one we're interested in. In a number of species, it confers 80 to 90 percent resistance to parasite attacking pea aphid. There's evidence in raspberry aphids, and we're still trying to look at what's going on in the potato aphid. Uh, I'm supposed to be meeting with Ali on Thursday and finding out the results of the experiments into that one. Um, without Hamiltonella defensa, there's 30 to 70 percent resistance to parasite attack. So, you know, they do survive some of the time. But the big thing here is there's no fitness cost that we can find, or very little. Um, and there's been a lot of work trying to work out why this might be, why this might be, and there's, uh, maybe there's this cost, maybe there's that cost, maybe there's, there's the other. They can't find it, and all the models people have done, you have to have ridiculously high fitness costs to make these things coexist. So, we look at a bit of models. What we're saying is we've got adult hosts which reproduce, adult hosts which reproduce and die natural deaths, and parasitoids which, if we ignore development time, parasitoids parasitize the adult hosts, and those develop, and the parasitoids may die. We're ignoring development time, so we don't actually care whether it's a parasitized host or whether it's an adult parasitoid parasitoid, because there's no development time, it's instantaneous. <laughs> what you get there is some kind of reproduction which is limited by both host species, that's your standard logistic error, with parasitism occurring on host one with some efficiency rate, parasitism occurring on host two with some efficiency rate. That efficiency rate is conversion to parasitoids, and then I have a natural death rate. It's a pretty straightforward standard model. What we're interested in is what that function of parasitism is. 
right, this is just non-dimensionalised to look a wee bit prettier, um, just to prove we've done. We had an ordinary Holling Type 2 response. What you've got is an attack rate and a handling time. That's your disk equation, essentially. You can only get coexistence. It's very easy to prove if the efficiency is identical on both parasitoids. It cannot happen. However, there's quite good evidence for learning. If we introduce the switching penalty, and we say, actually, there's a penalty for switching from having parasitized one parasitoid in your last you know, parasitoid type 1, moving to parasitoid type still, that would be staying on type 1, Okay, and this would be having parasitized type 2, moving to parasitoid type 5. Okay? So what we're going to assume is if I'm staying with the same parasitoids, there's no cost in terms of increasing my handling time. Um, if I'm switching from 2 to 1 or 1 to 2, then there might be a cost. So that's going to be less than 1 because I'm going to be slower to handle it. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm reducing my attack rate. Okay? Now, if we assume that the efficiency on parasitoid 1 is greater than 2, it's very crunch the algebra, isn't it? Um, you can show that providing this um, penalty, if you like, is less than the ratio of the efficiency on 2 minus the death rate at the uh, parasitoid times the handling time, divided by efficiency 1 minus death rate times the handling time, you will get that's, that's the boundary of the um, stable interior. Which is all well and good, but the question is, can we realistically do this? I've implemented this, I'm just going to put the link, there's an R package called StagePop, which does quite nice um, stage structured modelling. It's a quick solver for stage structured modelling. Um, these are experimentally derived parameters. They're sort of bang in the middle range of experimentally derived parameters. For the sake of time, I won't go through this. I will simply turn around and say, actually, we're getting about 10% to 70%, which is a bang on what we're seeing in the field. I haven't manipulated this. I've put the parameters in, and that's what fell out. We got our stability with about 65% reluctance. That's a wee bit on the high side, but it's not entirely unreasonable particularly if you start to put in spatial refugia impacts down the line. Now, that's ignoring development times. And the only thing I will say, I won't go into the detail of the model, except to say what I've done is I've introduced the juvenile stage. So that's where the parasitism occurs, and if they survive. Lots of horrible delay differential equations. But when we solve them, we still, although we, we start to see limit cycles, it does maintain a stable coexistence at realistic rates. So all we've done is introduce a reluctance to change from what we know. And that's evidenced by being having seen in beetles in the lab where they could extend coexistence by having a learning thing going on, as in during the experiments, where if you introduce two competitive species and you had um, one goes extinct or the other if you have two species of beetles. You introduce a parasitoid that has learning on one versus the other, you can extend the coexistence from 10 days to about three or four months. So it really is a phenomenon that has been seen, and it's very powerful, and I think we ignored it. Question. Question. There's an interesting uh, bit of biology about amphibious and related parasitoids that when they emerge from the host, they antenate the mummy, the aphid mummy, and learn the chemical cues from that in order to go off, and then they use those cues to find further. Could that possibly be part of the delay, part of the penalty? It could well be. Um, as I say, we haven't we haven't quite. But it's also, I mean, they're, they're, that, that could be in addition almost, but it, it's also seen in a single parasitoid um, doing it. But it, yeah, it could well be. I'd love to know more about that, actually. Because, uh, as I say, not these, we're chasing this down in the lab. This is, uh, we've got three years' worth of kind of 
to and fro a, a lab time with it as well. So um, I'm actually chasing down to find out more about that. Yes, so the thing about the symbiont is it's in what you've got is a vertically transmitted symbiont. There is not a lot of evidence for horizontal transmission. Um, so essentially what you've got is a, uh, is, is a species that's the same in all respects except that it carries this symbiont. They're just strains of the same species. And it's just weird that they coexist. And they really do coexist. Um, is there any evidence that they lose uh, the No, they might have got it or they haven't. Um, you can, they have tried to cure them of it, but I, it seems to take them generations of aphids to get to clean the left chances. You can cure them as antibiotics, but you're exactly right, they don't normally do anything. Um, so. I think we we'd probably better wrap up there, but uh, let's thank Catherine and indeed all the speakers one more time. <laughs>